think we should get going a little bit on this. I want to get Tim, uh, get everyone up to speed on, on digital again. Uh, some of you already have an idea of that, but we want to make sure everyone's at the same level or close to it so that when our, our, our professional uh, vendors are here to start talking about their products or their services, that everyone starts at the same level and, and, and can continue on up. Uh, and, and understand what they're talking about. And again, when we get to that point, in this case here, ask him all the questions you can. Uh, when the vendors come in this afternoon, hold your questions, write them down with notepads, and save them for the round table at the end of the show. I'm Tim Reed. I work the uh, Old Prairie Twister column, and uh, Justin's a uh, bit of news. And uh, let, let me start by thanking Justin for organizing Dinner and getting us all together. Let's get this uh, Justin puts the newsletter out as, at his own expense and spends all the time putting it together, mailing it out, mailing the hard copies out, publishing the digital copies. So, if you've uh, seen the Dinner News, you may be wondering, or you didn't see my first column, you may be wondering, what's this crank twisting business? <laughs> that actually, I got that from old uh, International Projectionist Magazine. I don't know if any of you have been around in the business long enough to remember that. Uh, they referred to old timers as crank twisters, which uh, harkened back to the silent screen days when a lot of those guys. The old timers then were indeed crank twisters, cranking the projectors. So I just kind of adapted that to uh, to mean old timers. So and old timers now may go back to the carbon art days, and more frequently we're going to hear how the old timers were film guys. Okay, so the buzzword today is digital. Digital, digital, digital. You got digital music, digital television, digital phones, and now we're into the realm of digital movies. So how are you fixed for digital in your theater? Fifteen years ago we might have called this presentation how you fixed for shutter blades. Do you remember that commercial? How you fix for blades, but uh, so uh, th th this is this is the best way. So how do you fix for digital? As we're going to see, it's not going to it's not all that complicated to get in the digital game. And that's not to say it's not going to cost money. Uh, but with a little knowledge of the basic components involved in going digital we can be better equipped to make informed decisions. Uh, for the past few years, the powers that be in Hollywood have sent us one <coughs> clear message. <coughs> our risk of losing our everlasting insurance and our soft. Could it be the Spanish Inquisition? No one expects the Spanish <laughs> So you may be asking, well, why should I install digital? So what? I like the way I've been running. It served me well all these years. If it works, don't fix it. Well, I, I agree with that sentiment, but eventually progress changes the rules. Uh, eventually we won't be able to get film prints. No one knows when that will be, but uh, you can be sure it can't come quick enough for all of it. Therefore, if we want to stay in business, we will have to convert eventually. One positive reason to upgrade is there will be an immediate benefit that is visible on the screen. 
Uh, your presentations will be more consistent. Uh, the 100th showing of the digital print is just as good and clear and sharp as the first. But, of course, the most compelling reason to convert to digital because Hollywood says so. They've given us that mandate, like it or not. But, surely, you say Hollywood wouldn't require us to spend money on equipment or risk facing not being able to run movies to begin with. I'll stretch it with a couple of the red readers. They've done this before. Uh, and a couple of these would be running silent movies today if we didn't spend money. So this isn't entirely unprecedented with Hollywood. <clears throat> I mentioned you'd, you'd see an immediate benefit on the screen with the digital upgrade, which begs the question, is digital better? Well, Yes and no, it depends on what aspect we're talking about. Uh, since digital projection is not strictly an upgrade, but instead an entirely new paradigm. Film and digital can't be fairly compared side by side because they possess different properties and methodology. We can, however, uh, compare them at the point where their function becomes common and that is on the screen. Image resolution. Now this is the potential of an image to resolve detail. The higher the resolution, the more detail an image can be. Uh, these values you hear associated with digital cinema, 2K, 4K, and what does all that mean? This refers to the number of pixels or picture elements in the horizontal dimension of the uh, of the image. In other words, 2K means there are roughly 2,000 pixels across the width of that picture. Uh, you may be familiar with the megapixel rating of consumer camera. Now that uh, refers to the total number of pixels available. Uh, for our 2K flat image in digital cinema, that roughly equates to 2.2 megapixels. Scope is about 1.8 megapixels. And this scope is smaller than digital cinema. 35 millimeter resolution. Again, this is one of these areas where film and digital can't be fairly compared on a level field because the film isn't comprised of pixels. Uh, the image on film is built using the grain of the emulsion. However, their equivalent pixel ratings have been estimated as high as 8K with 35 millimeter. So, uh, looking at it this way, you can see how digital might seem to fall short in, uh, in this attribute. However, digital has an important quality. It turns out that it makes up nicely for this handicap. The digital image looks very good on the screen in part because it's so steady. It's rock solid. There is no jump and weave. Any jump and weave in a digital movie is so it would be if the film was made, was shot in 35 millimeter and then changed, transferred to digital. Uh, so the image, any image of steadiness would be born from the motion picture camera that filmed it. Um, a considerable amount of resolution or apparent resolution in pixels in 35 millimeter is lost because of the jump and weave and projection. Now that's part of the reason why I've been able to make digital trailers available for the past 10 years that I've sourced from digital image files that are 2K resolution. When they're shown on the screen in 35 millimeter, it's the jump and weave covers for the fact that it's just 2K resolution. So they can almost look almost as good as the features. But, um, and if you look at one of my trailers under a microscope, you can see the pixels, but you'll never see them on the screen because they're like dark. <laughs> uh, a 
Okay, the screen elimination. On the screen, it's a digital driver. Again, this is one of those areas. Mm, you're not comparing the same values. Um, the physics operate differently between the 35 millimeter foam system and the digital projection system. Now, the physics of light are the same, it's just they're different. The optics are different. So, is digital brighter per watt of xenon than 35 millimeter? Some might say no. Uh, digital, but digital light is on the screen 100% of the time, <laughs> as opposed to 50% or less with 35 millimeter because of the shader. So, on average, digital can better utilize larger lamps than 35 millimeter because the optics are much slower in a digital lamp house or light pipe. Uh, which results in an exceptionally smoother and more evenly lit screen consistently. So on the screen, which again is our only common frame of reference, digital can certainly deliver a brighter image with no hot spots. Compared to 35 millimeter, anyone who is remotely savvy with computers can operate a digital system. It's very intuitive. Uh, from a scheduling standpoint, you can network your system to a computer in your office. Or you can run on the preset start times with the built-in uh, scheduler on the film servers. And you won't even have to enter the booth all week just to turn the power on or whenever you change shows. So the ease and operation of flexibility of digital offers is very high. I don't think anyone here uh, would disagree that 35 millimeter wins in the expense department, hands down. So make a note. Now we know the reasons why and what we have to do. Just to explain more uh, what a digital image is for those who might not be clear on this. Uh, again, it consists of thousands of tiny little squares called pixels. That's what's making up that image there. Even though the original image was on film, it's been scanned to digital so that I could restore it and use it in trailers. Uh, but there's actually thousands of little squares. So let's look at one of those areas right now. I'm gonna take that little area right here. We're gonna look at it over here. And you can see the individual squares light and dark different colors. So uh, those, uh, those little squares combine, of course, to, to make an image. Hey, Tim? Yes? On those uh, pixels that we see there, that box that you uh, uh, that composes the, the full picture, uh, the 2,000 um, pixels, are they in each square? Or, I mean, what's the size of the square? It's not the whole picture, there's there's uh, thousands of pixels on that. Right, and, yeah, this well, is millions of pixels on that little section. There. Right, so I mean, uh, so each of those little pixels that we can see in that magnified version, this is one uh, that's, each of those is one pixel. Yeah. One, right. Two, three, four, five. So then uh, when you talk about uh, the entire picture on the screen, uh, and, and you, we're talking about 2,000 pixels across the, across the length of, mm -hmm. What are we talking about? Across the length of what? Across the, the width of that whole image. Of that whole image? There's yeah. 2,000 pixels right across the width of that image, roughly. 2K image in uh, D uh, digital cinema is uh, 1,998 pixels wide okay. by 1,080 high. Okay. <laughs> so there's that. That's the 2K yeah. image. Okay. See. And uh, scope is actually a little bit wider. It's 2048 by 858. So scope in digital cinema, rather than 35 millimeter, you use more of the film area to make scope and you stretch it out over, across the screen. And with digital, they letterbox. So scope in digital is actually less resolution. Do you, do you have a question? Yeah, there? that doesn't seem like very many pixels to me, but uh, is this, I was under the impression that it was 2K megapixels, which means 2,000 
No, no, that's the, the, the 2K is so across the width. Isn't that 2K megapixels? Oh, no, megapixels is, is the total. That's the height times the width. That's, there's 2.2 megapixels in that whole image. But the, the 2K is referring to how, you know, the width. So roughly, roughly the image size you're talking about where the number of pixels is, is roughly the size of a picture of an ordinary 35 millimeter frame roughly, and, and which then you take 1998 pixels times 1080 pixels high, and that gives you the total number of pixels in that entire frame. Which is 2.2 million mirrors. There you go. Yeah, it's approximately a million mechanical mirrors in each color, the light edge. That's being transmitted. So we're we're going to get to that. <laughs> so my worst fear is projecting an image that looks like a Monet painting on a sixty foot wide screen. Yeah, but how far away from the sixty foot screen are you looking at? It depends on where you are. Yeah. You know, it does it look like unless you, get, like that? The, you get, unless you get one percent maybe distance up to the screen, I I can't see it. But I can't see anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it, it. okay. Here we go. Here we go. We're gonna get it. We'll jump there. Okay, so that you think well, this may all be well and good, but so how do you is this projected on our screen? It's not film. You can't look through it. It's not transparent. This is the part of the digital cinema system. As the intermittent is the heart of the 35 millimeter projector, this is the heart of the digital cinema DLP projector. This is the digital micro mirror device, or known as DMD. And this is what creates the virtual image that is eventually projected. And you see the gray rectangle in the center. That's equivalent to the aperture in your 35 millimeter projector. Except that that gray area is composed of over 2 million little tiny hinged mirrors that respond to digital ones and zeros. It gets a digital one, it flips into position. Digital zero, it flips out of position. So what happens here? This is a schematic, uh, excuse me, uh, and the, the, the mirrors are a fraction of the width of human hair. They're very tiny. I think uh, Texas Instruments website said it's 120th the width of human hair. So, um, myself. Okay, so remember how the digital image is formed. Little squares of light and dark combine to form an image. This is the function of the DMD chip. Light from the xenon lamp is bounced onto the DMD chip. The on mirrors reflect into the projection lens and on the screen, and on the screen they translate into one pixel each. So when the mirror is on, the light from the xenon lamp gets bounced through the projection lines onto the screen. Now that's fine if you want areas of light and dark. The mirror is on, it projects white light as it, that appears as a pixel on the screen. To get shades of gray, and this is pretty ingenious, to get shades of gray, the amount of time that the mirror is on is adjusted to trick your eye into seeing shades of gray. So it's an essentially persistence of vision that creates grayscale. Tim? Yeah. So when the mirror is off, black is what shows up on the screen right. for that Absence pixel. Absence of light. No light from the xenon lamp reaches the screen. Yeah. In theory. Right. <laughs> so each dark and moving mark the, the, the dark in the movie means that the mirror is not on, that, op, that particular pixel area is not operating. So does that increase the heat value in that thing? 
there's a target inside the some of the projectors. I, I don't know about the newer ones. That it, it's it's a it's I forget what it's called too, but it, it absorbs the, the light from the mirrors that are off, that are reflected inside the projector. Okay. They just go to no one. So uh, the DMD creates a virtual image by reflecting or modulating the light. That's what it takes essentially it's called. It's a light modulator. So how do we get color? That's, oh, this is a schematic of one of the individual mirrors, by the way. The only thing we're concerned with, how it does it, is irrelevant. The mirror is tilted by the application of the digital one or zero. How do we get color? We use three chips, red, green, and blue. From here, this is the lamp house, Xenon lamp, and it shines into a prism assembly. This bounces the light to the three DMD chips. We've got red here, green here, and blue down here. The on mirrors in those respective red, green, or blue chips reflect the light through the projection lens onto the screen. And when they combine the three colors with differing grayscale values of each, then the com colors combine on the screen to create millions and millions of possible color combinations. Is everyone clear on the concept? Any questions? Here's, a, here's another look. Like, what was that? Hey, let's go build on that. <laughs> <laughs> and here's another look at several of the mirrors. Some of them on, some of them off. You can see how they kind of flip over. And the uh, DMD package is uh, completely sealed. So no dust, dark, anything can get in between the mirrors. Is there anyone that doesn't understand how the DMD works? Jim, these mirrors are on a mechanical hinge? Yes, very microscopic. I don't know if you remember several years ago, there was technology that was developed that allowed, uh, much as uh, uh, computer chips are formed by etching, photograph, photo etching into substrate layers, there was a, a method device that people could form little tiny motors and stuff. Gears and everything made the same way. It's the same principle. It's made just like a computer chip. And of course, 4K resolution is becoming available. You don't have to go 4K. 4K and 2K is designed to be one backwards compatible to the other. So Hollywood's not going to say, "Okay, you got to go 4K and not get this picture." So that's that's not that's not supposed to happen. And I think uh, I think 4K is like 4,096 pixels. Would the physics involved in your particular situation determine whether you have to do 2K or 4K? I'm sorry, what was that? The physics involved, how far the throw is, how big your screen no. is. No. no. Now that's just the resolution of the image. How many pixels comprise that digital image? So this is uh, whatever it is, four times more pixels available than with the 2K. Right, but I think the selling point from the manufacturers is just what you said. You have an indoor screen, you have a 60 foot screen stadium seating, and you're 10 feet from the screen in the front row. A 4K may be what you want to look for in the better pixel resolution. It, yeah, because the pixels are small. Yeah. That's Absolutely. what the 4K is for. It's a big indoor room. Yeah, I, was, you know, I was sitting here calculating pixels on my screen would be a third of an inch across. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you, you would have to be like right up on the screen to see that. Right. There, you, so I, using my projector, you can go off and you can look at them. And there, you can see them. Yeah. But you got to be, you can have my screen 60 feet. You've got yeah, you to be right there. I mean, you can definitely see them. But 
you know, again, this is this is the this is where we're going. I mean, that's where the industry is going. And years ago, I saw flight papers on a, an eight K system. So even that's being in development somewhere. Somebody's working on eight K. So, okay. So you may be asking, if I'm going to install digital in my projection booth, just what does that involve? What equipment do I need? Uh, do I have to go to the full blown system with uh, uh, a library management system and uh, you know network uh, switches everywhere? What do I absolutely have to have? Okay, well let's let's look at those considerations. Now I realize there's some indoor owners here too, but since this presentation is geared mostly to driving owners. That's what I'm going to deal with here in respect to the audio requirements. So I'm assuming everyone at least has this right now. Some form of FM transmitter, radio sound, stereo. Could, could, uh, Lou, uh, Tim, it could be a processor too for the indoor theater operator. Well, that's what I'm saying. In, in, in lieu of that, for this process. respect, yeah. we're, we're going to assume because I do mix down the two channel here. Uh, you know, that could be your Dolby CP650. So starting here, this is going to be a basic, basic bare bones digital system. You need the projector, obviously. Um, this is it. It's completely self-contained. Uh, in this particular model, which is, which is a Marco, just for no other reason than I'm Marco certified. <laughs> I have uh, a lot of experience with Marco. Uh, the xenon lamp house, the power supply rectifier, the imaging engine, which is also called the light engine, that's the DMD chips and all the associated circuitry. Uh, the control circuitry, the projection lens are all inside this one unit. It's totally self-contained. In fact, if you have a theater in a location that requires you to shut down for the winter and winterize your booth, rather than removing the projection lens and covering the projector in a plastic sheet. I don't know that I would take the whole projector off with for the winter. I mean, that's a lot of money saved. I mean, it depends on the security of the theater. It's not, a, it's not difficult to get a couple of guys to lift that thing out. You know, it's not much bigger than, or smaller than this table. Is this particular projector has manual controls here to, turn, to change format? Um, to uh, uh, turn the lamp on and off, uh, open and close the dowser, focus and shoot the lens. So, and also you notice on this one there's a touch panel back here. Please, if, particularly on Marco, if you're going to get, please budget for a touch panel for every projector, rather than guys that are in service on the one on top Rather than a lot of it, uh, complexes will get one touch panel and take it around to 14 different projectors. The little plug gets messed up, somebody drops a touch panel, then you have no communication with any projector. So I would just budget for that. And I think on a Christie projector, it's required. You can't even run manual without a touch panel on Christie. It says yes. Okay, the second basic component we need is the server. This is uh, this holds the uh, digital files. This holds the movie trailers, policy trailer types. Everything plays from that. So, Tim, basically, that's our platter. That's your platter. Yeah, that's a good analogy. That's your platter. That's nice. And this is, this one here is a Do Re Mi model. It can also be configured to control the projector, turn the uh, house dimmers on and off, and switch your audio processor. All right, that's okay, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's computer stuff. <laughs> but I agree with that. It, it, and, and we have seen prices drop as more units get in the field, and I assume that will that'll continue for you know, some time. Okay, um, 
I forget how my presentation was. Okay. Since the uh, we need uh, a mixer down here, since the audio output of the server is going to be a full blown 5.1 channels of soundtrack, um, we'll do that. Two cables connect the server to the projector, the SDI cables, that's the video signal A and B. And then you need a network cable, which is an Ethernet gigabit switch. Uh, that can be a Cat5 or Cat6 cable, just connects the two. Let's the server and the projector communicate with one another. Without that, they can't run. That's the basics. Okay, as I said, the audio coming from the servers, 5.1, assuming the server has an analog output, you have 5.1 channels of audio coming out of that. Of course, your stereo FM transmitter at the driver is not going to like that. Because either you're going to have music and effects and no dialogue, or you're going to have dialogue and half the music. Too. So we have to mix that down somehow to um, a format that the transmitter will like. The mixer will do that. We need to pull it down to two channels, left and right. So I don't know if, uh, if you saw an article I did recently that did a news which gave a suggested mixing scheme. Basically, you want this out of the five point channels, five point one channels of audio, you've got left, center, right, left surround, right surround, and so on. The surround channels you could probably just throw away. Uh, they're mostly effects. Occasionally, there's important information on there, so I, I suggest you mix them in as a test. If it, if it doesn't muddy the sound too much, you know, leave them in. But I, I know instances where people just leave them off. How many, the channel, how many channels on the mixer for input? That'll depend on the mixer you get. How, what would be the minimum required? Uh, if you want the surrounds, uh, four. Four. You're starting with five, right? Yeah, well, yeah, five, you can, well, you can twist the surrounds together and mix those down. So you can run the surrounds in one if you want. But you basically, you need a stereo mixer. The one, the one I've got pictured that we're doing is a Shure uh, SCN 260. What is that? 262. It will do that. So, but roughly what you want to do is you want to make sure that this, the center channel audio coming from the server is louder than the other channels because that carries all the dialogue. If you just twist all the channels together, which I've seen some people do, you twist all the channels together, left, center, right, the music and effects that are present on the left and right channels will just swamp the dialogue out. And you'll end up with hearing explosions and music and people moving their mouths on the screen and it'll sound like they're in the back room. So, this, uh, if you just get this center channel above the other channels by you know, 3 dB or something, experiment with it, see what sounds good. Yes? Between the server and the mix, do you or do you not have any data to burn? I'm getting it. <laughs> this is assuming that audio is output from the server is analog. However, Most servers you're going to find have a digital audio output. This is where you need a digital to analog converter. This one's a, a Del Rey Me, and I think uh, Ultra Stereo makes one. Maybe a couple of other companies make good at digital analog converters. In that case, the audio output, which would be 5.1 digital audio out of the server, we're going to do a converter, which will convert it to 5.1 analog. Then you can run it back down to the mixer and we can do our mix down to two channels as before. Any questions on this? Is everyone clear? Yeah. I've got a smart mod 2 processor on this. Where would that fit in there? That would be right here. Or it will send the start to mix down to get, unless they've got on a small mod two, you do, do they have an extra a, 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 back with the left and the right? You mix down prior to get into the mod two, okay. You go into the nonsense rails of the back of the mod two. B. Okay, 
So they don't have a six channel input? No, they have no. a two channel input. It's two channel all the way through, but you can run okay. the left and right on the non sync rails. It can be done. Okay. okay, I've got some. If you come to the driving, I'll have to show you. I've got some running that way right now. All right. So yeah, that. ladies and gentlemen, that's Mark Murray, our host yeah. of the Galaxy, just in case didn't know we'll be with him very shortly. How's everybody doing today? So that's basically it. That's what you need to get in the digital game. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. This is each booth, right, Tim? Yes, yes. Each booth. That will let you run a digital movies. I just uh, just to show you how intuitive it is to operate one of these things. Let's look at the, some of the software on the Adobe Mini server. Okay, this is the editor screen. When you get your hard drive from the film company and you load it into the server, it will show up on the left hand side here. This also has uh, shows the cues in this particular picture, shows the cues that have been built into this particular server. Okay, and there's another one where it, shows, it lists the movies. Well, that, those are actually the keys. They unlock the movies. Well, lock there, that means there's a key for Madagascar in here that's valid. There's one for Mission Impossible 3 here that's out of date. It won't let you run that movie anymore unless you get a valid key from the distributor. So you use this screen to build your playlist. The playlist is your schedule. If you want to start, take the house lights down, Run a truck, run an opening snipe. Welcome to the drive in. Run a trailer. This is where you select from. Every time you select an element, it appears over here. Build your playlist and you can save that playlist and you can run that over and over and over. And on the bottom here, you see the tabs where you can select the different the editor, the playback screen, or your schedule. Now let's look at the playback screen. Everyone, uh, I, I would assume, is familiar with the function of these buttons. They are similar to a video player on your computer. This is where you play your playlist from. You load the playlist. Over here in the little window on the right is the playlist. And the elements in that playlist, see they've got start flat here. Uh, National Geographic Lions trailer, Santa Claus 3 trailer, and then the movie called Serenity yeah. here. Yeah. Critics queue, which takes the house lights up. Black, uh, just a section of black on the end. Very simple. Here's the scheduler screen. This is where you can program your start times in. You can do that for all week and never have to enter the booth. Uh, this, that's just a brief look at what uh, what you need to get in the digital center. Yeah. So, Tim, I you, you talked about on the on the playlist thing where you put your trailers in. Mm -hmm. Will all of the existing screen attractions trailers that we're playing now on screen will they be available? Yeah, good question. Thanks for asking that. All the trailers that I've made uh, under the screen attractions banner, the Welcome to the Drive-In Policy trailer, the, the uh, Global Food trailer, all the little snipes, we're going to have digital versions of those available. In fact, you'll see some of them tonight at Martin's Theater. We've got a, a sampler, about three and a half minutes worth of stuff that we've done before. And of course, all the stuff is, is made digitally anyway, so you know there's no, there's no generation loss there. We're already in digital, so. It'll be a very pure image. So we'll see that tonight. And also made up some custom sites for Martin too, for his theater. It's got a theater name. So we'll, well, I see we'll see those. Yeah, okay, they're all. Yeah. No more dancing hot dogs? <laughs> well, that's so about that. <laughs> yeah, it, it is available. We had a track for it. And just one last thing I want to show you here. Um, just to show you how easy it is, 
I've got a, uh, uh, just a short video from Barco on how to change the xenon bulb in one of their projectors. <laughs> I just have a, one quick thing is a lot of the questions regarding how you program the projector and, and service it and where to turn it on and all that, you're going to physically see that tonight at the Galaxy as Mark goes around and shows you all the equipment. You'll get to actually right there in front of your eyes, see what's going on. Uh, this gives you kind of a rough idea to get started with. But sure. Uh, Definitely, you, you can see the list of, uh, it's, of his, it's, his playlist right there in front of you. It, it's not all, you know, digital is not all that daunting, and, and certainly do not be afraid of it. It's, it's really, it's just, a, it's just different. And sometimes we're afraid of uh, change or things that are different. Which also I wanted to touch on that briefly, is how it changes formats between flat and scope. I don't know if you notice on the uh, on the picture, it's got one lens. That is the only lens you will have with that projector, unless you are 3D, and then you'll have a, either a Z screen or if you Dolby, you don't you don't need an extra uh, polarizer. You'll have one lens that is your flat and your scope. And what happens is that lens is motorized. It shifts in the uh, up and down and, and side to side, and it also it, 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 you can focus it with the motors and it zooms. So when you change from flat to scope, if the installer has it set up right, the picture blanks, the lens repositions itself, zooms, and focuses to the new setting. Picture unblanks, and there's your flatter scope. So that, Tim, is in lieu of having to have change your aperture plate and yeah. change your lens. No, no aperture plate, no lens changes. So in all these settings for the, the different formats, uh, the, the, the <coughs> lens settings, that's all saved in the projector on that touch panel. Tim, I, maybe I heard this wrong a while ago. Somebody mentioned something that said that in digital, your scope picture is small. It is. On the, on the chip. On the chip, not on the, the screen. Box. Not on the screen. Right. No, it, it'll, it'll be larger on the screen because you, you zoom it out to fit. So if you zoom that out, then the scope image is actually lower resolution than the flat. It's totally backwards from 35 millimeter. There was an uh, experiment. I'll, I'll get to your question in just a minute. There was an experiment done. Some theaters are still set up this way, but it's a very small minority of using an amorphosized image on the DMD chip. Uh, I think Christie projectors. Uh, we're definitely set up for this. And they had a little 1.25x anamorphic that flipped in front and stretched out and used more of the chip surface. But by and large, the practice now is to just letterbox it and zoom in on it. So, here, I'm sorry, your question? No, I was actually going to touch on the anamorphic field. I we're using that a lot with really large screens. By using more of the chip or the entire chip, yes. uh, you I prefer that. I definitely prefer You get a lot more brightness on the screen yeah. and you make better use of the are, are, are the prints still available that way? Yeah. Okay. Right. It's, it, the scaling is going to be done on the chip and the video processor and projector. Okay. And all three manufacturers will like you. That, that's good. Yeah, yes. Let's go back to the basics. What's that run on? 110? Uh, there, it depends on the size of the projector. Most of it, I would count on three phase. Three phase. Yeah. Uh, two, two, uh, 208. 440. Yeah. No, no. Well, that depends on how, if you can order it that way from the factory. Since Barco's made in Belgium, I'm sure the 440 is not a, un, unheard of. And the power usage compared to a regular projector? <clears throat> uh, you got me on that. I haven't, I haven't looked at these specs. I, I, but I tell you, on the, on the installs that I've done, like for a, a, a 32, this is this is a, a DP2K32B. I, I, I'll spec out a 40 amp break, three phase, 220, 40 amp. So it's comparable, I guess, to a 30 millimeter lamp. That's pretty easy. So what could go wrong with it? <laughs> That's a whole other seminar. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the, the good thing though is they keep improving this. This is a, what's, what's known as a series two projector. And they took 
six or seven boards and consolidated them down into just two or three. And don't, those are all that in here. Uh, there's one um, integrated cinema processor board, ICP, and there's been some issues with that. Largely, they've gotten taken care of with uh, firmware upgrades, so that the problems are gradually getting ironed out with that. So, so if it breaks, you have to have somebody come in and probably fix it, right? You can't wait to fix it. Depends on what happens. A lot of stuff, I've, I've fixed a lot of people over the phone just having them go through life. There was an issue once uh, uh, with some of the barcodes where they, they lose their lens memory. Change format and then we go to the center position. Picture would be too big, too small on the screen. You have to, and you can do that. You can fix it on the side with the manual controls. But then every time you change format, and get lost again. So I would talk people through on the touch panel how to resave the lens settings. So it really depends on what the issue is. Yeah, yes, back. There's no separate power supply for this. Right, it's all integrated. It's all in, it, it's a switching power supply in there somewhere. Yeah, the, the rectifier on this is in the <coughs> It's a switching power supply, usually two modules. Now some of the older ones like a DP100, they've got a separate power supply down in the pedestal. But uh, it's, it's now, especially now, there are largely self-contained. As far as uh, I mean, speaking of masking, the, we have our plates in there now. How are we going to do that? That usually, you know, you know, you talk like for an aperture plate. Yeah, I mean, you're, it's, you know, you're making a bigger screen. Yes, my screen is not normal. Mine's two point one one. Okay. So I'm going to lose part here and here. You could do it however you want. And you just get in there. If it's within the zoom range of the lens that you get, you can either have it fill the total screen and crop off the sides, or you can let box it a little bit and have it crop top and bottom. That's another thing that the DCI initiative specification say that you can only you're only allowed to crop a very small amount. I don't know what that figure is offhand. The test targets on the projectors when they come up. It'll say, you know, make sure that the green lines are showing or red lines or whatever it is. You're not supposed to go below that, but I've seen instances where they have. What's this library management sort of thing here? That's uh, mostly for a multi, and that's where all you talk to all your projectors at once. You can bring in the movies to one central location and upload them to the server. Okay, schedule nice. from that. You have separate booths like on the field, right? You can be able to get. How you move from one booth over to one that's Well, now, that's it. If you have an LMS like that, or if you're networked, you're some form of networking, you just send it down to the uh, Ethernet. Might be three, four hundred feet away, but if you're over four, if you're over three hundred feet, there's so much loss of ability to use like CAT5 or CAT6. A hundred CAT6 will build that call, and I'll plug it in. That's a good thing. That's a good point. Yeah, okay. Okay. I'll tell you what. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have to break for lunch. I, I, I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. Any questions?